in this lecture we will discuss about the adrenergic system so one of the topic in the adrenergic system is sympathomimetics so what are the sympathomimetics so these are the drugs which mimic the action of sympathetic nervous system before entering into the actual topic of sympathetic mimetics let us see a brief or outline of the nervous system so the nervous system is divided into two parts that central nervous system and peripheral nervous system so peripheral nervous system indeed it is divided into two parts that is somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system so somatic nervous system has voluntary actions like the action on smooth muscle contraction and its movements and the autonomous nervous system has involuntary activities like respiration circulation digesting and sweating so this autonomic nervous system it has two sets of neurons because the ner ner the nerves which are emerging out of this autonomic system are of two type two types one is efferent nerves and the other one is efferent nerves so efferent nerves are those which sends impulses to the cns system the sends the signals to the cns system for interpretation or for information as well as efferent nerves are those which receive the information from the cns system or they receive information from the brain and they, and they transmit those signals or information to different parts of the body and for this autonomous nervous system there are two branches there are sympathetic nervous system as well as parasympathetic nervous system these are the two nervous branches which are emerging out of this autonomic nervous system so here we can see the pictorial representation of sympathetic as well as parasympathetic nervous system so there are various effects of sympathetic activation as well as parasympathetic activation so on sympathetic activation it causes dilation of the pupils inhibition of saliva production it causes di uh, di it dilates the bronchial muscles it inhibits gall bladder it relaxes urinary bladder so there are various activities so there is various effects which are caused because of the sympathetic nervous system so the effects of this differ from organ to organ for example if it is acting on the heart it causes increase in the heart rate if it is acting on the urinary system it causes relaxation of the urinary bladder if it is acting on the eye it causes dilation of the pupils so these are few of the effects of sympathetic nervous system whereas when coming to parasympathetic nervous system it shows the effects like it constricts the pupil it's quite opposite to that of the sympathetic nervous system if it is acting on the heart it causes decreased heart rate and if it is acting on the renal system it causes constriction of the urinary bladder on the respiratory system it causes constriction of the bronchial muscles so it is quite opposite to sympathetic nervous system and the effects vary from organ to organ so let us see about sympathetic nervous system so where is the sympathetic nervous system originated or is where it is located exactly so the sympathetic nervous system or the nerves of the sympath sympathetic system are emerging from thora in thoracolumbar region so in thora thoracic uh, region as well as i mean in the spinal cord the segments which are present in the thoracic region as well as the segments which are present in the lumbar region it involves all the segments of thoracic region but in lumbar region only l1 to l4 segments are involved i mean to up to l4 region the sympathetic nervous system is emerging out and it has short fibers it has preganglionic as well as pro uh, post ganglionic fibers so these preganglionic fibers if these activation of the preganglionic fibers takes place it leads to the release of the neurotransmitter called as acetylcholine as well as the post ganglionic fibers they lead to the if the post ganglionic fibers are innervated out of the sympathetic nervous system it leads to a neurotransmitter called as norepinephrine here we can see the sympathetic innervation so only sympathetic innervation if it is uh, the nerves or is the neurons which are supplying the nerves to the eye it it causes dilation of the pupil it causes uh, the it causes inhibition of secretion of the saliva it causes increased heart rate it causes bronchial dilation and in the kidneys it causes uh, the relaxation of the urinary bladder so these are few of the effects of sympathetic innervation 
Let us see the neurotransmitters which are involved in the sympathetic nervous system. So there are various neurotransmitters in the body. But the neurotransmitters act or the release of the neurotransmitters depend upon the system or the innovation which is involved. So in sympathetic nervous system, there are three neurotransmitters involved mainly. That is norepinephrine or noradrenaline. Adrenaline or epinephrine and the other one is dopamine and there are various new other neurotransmitters like acetylcholine which is acting on the cholinergic system or parasympathetic nervous system. So the action of neurotransmitter depends upon the system which is involved. So here we can see in sympathetic nervous system norepinephrine or epinephrine is considered as a neurotransmitter. And the drugs which mimic the action or else the drugs which show exactly the same action on sympathetic stimulation are called as sympathomimetics or we can say adrenergic agonist or adrenergic mimetics. Whereas the drugs which antagonize the response of the sympathetic nervous system are called as sympatholytics or adrenergic agonist or adrenolytics. Here we can see how the neurotransmitter is released and how it is showing its effect. So the neurotransmitter first it gets synthesized in the body. So the neurotransmitter for example let us take norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is synthesized from the amino acid L-tyrosine. Uh, tyrosine. From tyrosine dopa is, dopa is formed and from dopa dopamine is formed and from dopamine norepinephrine is formed and from norepinephrine epinephrine is formed. So after the synthesis of this neurotransmitter in the body then it, it's, it's getting stored. So there are some storage vesicles in the synapse, the synaptic nase where the dopamine as well as norepinephrine or whatever the neurotransmitter synthesized it is getting stored in the vesicles and once the storage of this vesicles once the neurotransmitter is stored in the vesicles whenever there will be the activation of that sympathetic nervous system then it causes release of the neurotransmitter so once the neurotransmitter is released it shows its actions and after that it has to undergo metabolism so here the neurotransmitter in adrenergic system is metabolized by two enzymes one is mao that is mono amino oxidase and the other one is comt that is catecholamine uh, o methyl transferase. So these are the two enzymes which are involved in the metabolism of these catecholamines. So here the metabolism of noradrenaline by the enzyme called MAO is taking place up to 80%. If noradrenaline is undergoing metabolism out of 100%, 80% is metabolized by monoamino oxidase enzyme and remaining 20% is metabolized by the enzyme catecholamine O methyl transferase and once it is metabolized it gets bind to the receptors and once it's bind to the receptors it shows its actions and after it is exerting its actions whatever the leftover noradrenaline or norepinephrine is present it is getting reuptake or as it is getting reabsorbed into the system and once it's getting reuptake and again it, it undergoes the process of synthesis and metabolism so this is a cy cyclic process so the reuptake mechanism is very important in the synthesis of noradrenaline. So here we can see the pictorial representation. Here once the neurotransmitters are synthesized we can see the synaptic vesicles where the neurotransmitter is stored and uh, once the neurotransmitter is released it is binding to the particular receptors which are present and exerts its actions. What are the various types of adrenergic receptors? So we saw these neurotransmitters are binding to receptors, receptors. So what are the types of receptors which are present in the adrenergic system? So there are mainly three types of receptors. Mainly we can say two types of receptors. Alpha as well as beta receptors. So as dopamine is one of the neurotransmitters involved in the adrenergic system, dopaminergic receptors are also considered as a type of the adrenergic or else, uh, or else adrenoreceptors. So here the adrenoreceptors are categorized as alpha receptors, beta receptors as well as dopaminergic receptors. And these alpha receptors are further categorized as alpha 1 receptors and alpha 2 receptors. And beta 2 receptors are classified as beta 1, beta 2 as well as beta 3 receptors. So here we can see uh, the... 
uh, we can see the representation of the receptors, their location and the effect. So here if we see the alpha 1 receptors. So alpha receptors are two types alpha 1. Uh, out of that alpha 1 receptors are present in various tissues, smooth muscles and few of the glands. So here these alpha receptors or all adrenoreceptors are G protein coupled receptors. So these G protein coupled receptors involve the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP by two pathways. One is IP3 that is inositol triphosphate pathway and DAG that is diacylglycerol pathway. So whatever the phospholipid uh, which is present in this uh, adrenergic system it is undergoing division or else it is lysed, it is hydrolyzed to inositol triphosphate as well as diacylglycerol. So on the action of these two, the, we can say these are considered as secondary messengers. So in the GPCR type of receptors, there are two secondary messengers. One is IP3 and the other one is DAG. Because of this cyclic AMP conversion also, the new GPCR type of receptor action is going on. So the GPCR type of receptors are further classified as GQ type of receptors, GI type of receptors and GS type of receptor. So the indication of Q, I and S is based on the location of the GPCR type of receptor. So alpha 1 is a GQ type of the G protein coupled receptors and it involves a secondary messenger called IP3 and DAG. So when there is increase in the inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol secondary messengers then it shows the effects of increase the calcium levels. Once the calcium levels are increased in the bloodstream, it causes constriction of the blood vessel or contraction of the blood vessel or a smooth muscle we can say. As these are located in the smooth muscles, it causes the contraction of the smooth muscle as well as it causes glandular secretion. So wherever the alpha receptors present in the glands, in that particular glands, the secretion will be increased on stimulation of alpha 1 receptors. When coming to alpha 2 receptors, these are present at the nerve endings and some of the smooth muscles. And this is GI type of GPCR receptors and it involves the secondary messenger called as cyclic AMP. So when there will be decreased in the cyclic AMP, as I told you, ATP is converted to cyclic AMP by the action of an enzyme called adenylyl cyclase. So when there will be decreased the cyclic AMP, it leads to decreased transmitter release. Whatever the transmitters or whatever the signals which are released from the nerve endings will be decreased. Apart from that, it causes constriction of the smooth muscle. The other type of receptor is beta 1 receptor. So these beta 1 receptors are present in cardiac muscle as well as juxta glomerular apparatus in the kidney. So this also, this is a type of GS kind of G protein coupled receptors and this involves a secondary messenger called cyclic AMP. If there is any increased levels of cyclic AMP, it shows the effects of as it is present in the cardiac muscle, it shows increased heart rate, it shows increased force of contraction of heart and it shows increased renin release because renin is released from the juxta glomerular cells. So when this juxta glomerular apparatus is stimulated or uh, beta cells which are present in the uh, beta receptors which are present in the juxta glomerular apparatus get stimulated, it causes excessive release of renin. And the other type of receptors are beta 2 receptors and these beta 2 receptors are present in the smooth muscle as well as cardiac muscle. And these are also GS kind of GPCR receptors and they involve a secondary messenger called cyclic AMP. Here also if there is any increase in the cyclic AMP levels only it causes a relaxation of the smooth muscle. So if it is acting on beta 1 receptors then increased cyclic AMP causes constriction. Whereas when it is acting on the beta 2 receptors, it causes relaxation of the smooth muscle and there will be increased heart rate, 
increased force of contraction of the heart as well as there it causes increased increased glycogenolysis so glycogenolysis is a process where glycogen is getting lysed or else there will be breakdown of glycogen to form glucose so all these processes will be increased when there is beta 2 stimulation and this beta 3 type of cells are located in the adipose tissue so these beta 3 cells are located in the adipose tissue and these are also GS kind of GPCR receptors. And here also they involve a secondary messenger called cyclic AMP. And if there is any increased cyclic AMP levels, it causes increased lipolysis. As it is present in the adipose tissue, it causes lysis or it causes breakdown of the lipids or metabolism of the lipids take place. Dopaminergic receptors. So, dopaminergic receptors, we have D1, D2 as well as D3 receptors. Particularly, D1 are mostly active receptors and this D1 receptors are present in the smooth muscle. And these are also the GS kind of GPCR receptors and they involve the secondary messenger called cyclic AMP. If there is any increase in the cyclic AMP levels, it causes a relaxation of the smooth muscle which is present in the renal system. So the renal vascular smooth muscles relaxation takes place on activation of D1 receptors. So let us see the classification of adrenergic agonists. So sympathomimetics. So we saw sympathomimetics are the drugs which mimic the action of sympathetic nervous system. So we saw the various actions of sympathetic nervous system. So these drugs they bind to the adrenoreceptors and they show sympathetic act actions or effects. So what are the drugs which are involved or is which come under the category of sympathomimetics. So here we have three categories of drugs. One is directly acting, the other one is indirectly acting and the other one is mixed acting. So what are this directly acting, indirectly acting and mixed acting. So directly acting, these are the drugs which directly go and bind to the receptors and exert their action. Indirectly acting, these are the receptor, these are the drugs which do not bind to the receptor directly but they inhibit the binding of adrenaline or noradrenaline to that receptors and they exert their action. Uh, sorry, they they in promote the uh, binding, they promote the affinity of the noradrenaline and adrenaline to the receptors and exert their action and mix the acting. The mix the acting are the drugs which bind to both. They show di both directly as well as indirectly actions. In the sense, these are the drugs which sometimes bind to the receptors directly or else they sometimes they promote the noradrenaline and adrenaline to bind to the receptors to, to, to show their action. So this is one of the classification of adrenaline adrenergic agonist or sympathomimetics. So the drugs come under this, which, uh, this category are directly acting. It involves drugs like adrenaline or epinephrine, noradrenaline or norepinephrine, salbutamol, isoprenaline, phenylephrine, dobutamine and dopamine. And indirectly acting drug is tyramine. Mixed acting drug is ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, phenylpropranolamine, amphetamine and methamphetamine. This is one classification of drug. But there is another classification also that is non-selective and selective. So this non-selective and selective classification is based on the type of receptors it is binding. For example, if a drug is binding only particularly alpha 1 receptor. There are two receptors, right? Alpha 1 receptor and alpha 2 receptor. If a drug is binding only particularly to alpha 1 receptor, we call that particular drug as selective alpha 1 adrenoagonist. If the drug is binding to both alpha receptors, that is alpha 1 as well as alpha 2, we call that drug, particular drug as non-selective alpha adrenergic agonist. So let us see the adrenergic agonist, non-selective adrenergic agonist. Norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is a directly acting or else norepinephrine is also called noradrenaline. So it is a directly acting sympathomimetic drug but it is non-selective. 
Why it is non-selective? Because it binds to all the adrenoreceptors except beta 2. So let us see about norepinephrine. So norepinephrine, it is not only a drug but it is also a neurotransmitter which is synthesized in the body itself. So once the neurotransmitter is synthesized in the body, it is released in the postganglionic sympathetic fibers in most of the organs. And apart from that, it is also released in the adrenal medulla. So this sympathetic innovation is present in various organs. So this noradrenaline is it is released from the uh, adrenal medulla and mostly uh, out of all over the body, noradrenaline is synthesized in all over the organs. But 20% of the noradrenaline is secreted from adrenal medulla only. Remaining 80% is contributed from all the other organs. And it is a non-selective drug as I told you because it binds to... Uh, it is a non-selective drug because it binds to all the adrenoreceptors except beta 2 receptors. So here this is the pictorial representation. So the L-tyrosine, it's an amino acid which on action of the enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase, it is forming L-dopa. And, and this L-dopa by the action of an enzyme called dopa decarboxylase, it is forming dopamine. And this dopamine on the action of dopamine beta hydroxylase, it is forming norepinephrine. Here we can see the norepinephrine once it is released, it is binding to alpha 1, alpha 2 as well as beta receptors also in order to show the sympathetic effect. Here we will see once... Uh, the neurotransmitters after the synthesis and storage, they undergo metabolism, right? So, the metabolism is taking place by the action of two enzymes, MAO and COMT. So, 80% is taking place with the enzyme called MAO. Here we can see the metabolism. So, norepinephrine by the action of the enzyme called COMT, it is converted to nor, nor metaphrine and by the action of monoaminotransferase, it is formed into norepinephrine aldehyde. So, this norepinephrine aldehyde is converted to normetaephrine aldehyde. And these by the action of an enzyme called alpha uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase, it forms two products that is 3,4-dihydroxymandelic acid. So, this normetaephrine aldehyde by the action of an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase, it is forming 3,4-hydroxymandelic acid which is further metabolized to vanillyl mandelic acid. So, this vanillyl mandelic acid is the metabolic product of norepinephrine. And there is another enzyme which is acting on this normetaphrine aldehyde or norepinephrine aldehyde that is aldehyde reductase. So when by the action of the aldehyde reductase, it forms 3-methoxy-4-hydroxyphenylglycol. So this is the another product which is formed on metabolism of norepinephrine aldehyde by the action of aldehyde reductase enzyme. And this on further action, it forms 3,4-dihydroxyphenylglycerol. So when vanillin mandelic acid and 3-methoxy-4-hydroxyphenylglycol. So these are the two end products of metabolism, metabolism of noradrenaline uh, by the action of the various enzymes. What are the sites of metabolism or where does the metabolism of this norepinephrine takes place? So norepinephrine metabolism mainly takes place at the adrenergic nerves. So in the adrenergic nerves after the storage and after the release, so 80% will take place by metabolism takes place by the enzyme called MAO and if ma MAO enzyme is inhibited, so there are the drugs which inhibit MAO. If this enzyme is inhibited, then noradrenaline or norepinephrine metabolism is not taking place and it leads to again release of noradrenaline. Because if metabolism won't take place, then it undergoes for reuptake mechanism. If reuptake con continuous reuptake mechanism of noradrenaline norepinephrine takes place, it causes release of norepinephrine where it leads to severe adverse effects. And remaining 20% is taken by the COMT. I mean the metabolism of norepinephrine takes place 50, uh, on 20% by the enzyme called COMT. Let us see the pharmacokinetics. 
So what happens once the noradrenaline is entering into the body? So the T half of this noradrenaline, norepinephrine is about 2 to 3 minutes. So once the noradrenaline or norepinephrine, once it is taken into the body, within 2 to 3 minutes, half of the drug is distributed out of, uh, distributed, and it is available in the bloodstream. And it is very short acting drug in the sense it undergoes metabolism very rapidly. It shows its action. It ex the onset of action of this drug is rapid as well as the metabolism of this drug is also rapid. And this noradrenaline or norepinephrine, when if it is acting in excessive amount, as it will, it's not getting metabolized, then the reuptake will take place, it causes release. Then in that condition, it causes increased blood pressure. That is, it causes increased systolic blood pressure as well as increased diastolic blood pressure. If blood pressure exceeds or if excessive blood pressure takes place, it leads to a condition called as shock or it leads to a... Con First, it leads to a condition called hypertension. And if this... Uh, blood pressure exceeds more than the hypotensic level then it leads to shock and this norepinephrine is recommended to be administered parenterally only it's not recommended to be given either orally or intramuscularly only parenteral route is administered let us see the uses of this nor uh, norepinephrine. So norepinephrine or noradrenaline, it is used in two different kind of shock that is cardiogenic shock as well as septic shock and apart from shock, it is also used in cardiac arrest. So if there is any cardiac failure or if there is any dysfunctioning of the heart, then this norepinephrine is recommended and it is also used in the shock and for the treatment of shock. Let us see the other drug that is epinephrine. So epinephrine is also a directly acting non-selective adrenergic agonist. So because it also binds to various kinds of adrenoreceptors. Here this epinephrine is released from the medulla oblongata of the brain. So in the adrenal medulla in, so, and, sorry, in the medulla oblongata of the brain as well as in the adrenal medulla. So the epinephrine is released mostly from these two parts. I mean 80% of the release is contributed by this adrenal medulla and brain and remaining 20% is uh, the 20% of the secretion is taking place in the other parts of the body. And this is also a non-selective acting drug and this uh, Rather than, I mean, uh, norepinephrine, we can say norepinephrine is not acting on beta 2 receptor. But this epinephrine, it also involves the action of beta 2 receptors. Here in this slide, we can see the biosynthesis of epinephrine. So, we are seeing the uh, synthesis of norepinephrine from so long slide. So, from L-tyrosine, DOPA, L-DOPA is synthesized from L-DOPA, dopamine, from dopamine, norepinephrine is synthesized. Here, once the formation of norepinephrine takes place, if the action of an enzyme called phenylethanolamine N-methyltransferase, so phenylethanolamine N-methyltransferase, if this enzyme acts on uh, norepinephrine, then it leads to a synthesis of epinephrine or adrenaline in the body. What are the pharmacokinetics of this no, epinephrine or adrenaline? So the T half of this adrenaline or epinephrine is almost about 2 to 5 minutes. And this, nor, uh, this epinephrine is also given parenterally only. It is also... Uh, Norepinephrine is given only parenterally. Here, epinephrine is given mostly recommended for parenteral route. Apart from that, if a person is having any tolerance or if a person is having any pain during IV route, then subcutaneous route as well as intramuscular route is recommended. But it is not given orally because it undergoes first pass metabolism. What are the uses of this epinephrine? So, this epinephrine or adrenaline have various effects because uh, it acts on various uh, parts of the body. For example, let us take the bronchial muscle. So what happens? So what is the effect of this noradrenaline or what is the use of this noradrenaline? Uh, what is the use of this epinephrine or adrenaline in the bronchial asthma? So in the bronchial asthma, it causes constriction of the bronchial smooth muscle, right? Here, this epinephrine, when it is given in subcutaneous root, 
for the uh, in bronchial asthma it is recommended to give in subcutaneous route once it is administered in subcutaneous route it causes stimulation of beta 2 receptors because it goes and binds to the beta 2 receptors and it exerts its action so if beta 2 receptors are getting stimulated it causes bronchodilation so thereby it is relieving from the bronchial asthma and it is a uh, Previously, I mean, it used to have many side effects, but now epinephrine is commonly administered and the side effects are very rare. Uh, those two, if uh, uh, epinephrine exceeds its dose, it leads to a condition called tachycardia as well as arrhythmia. This epinephrine is also recommended to be used in cardiogenic shock, the shock which is occurred, uh, which is occurred because of the cardiac failure. And in this cardiogenic shock, it is recommended to give in IV route only because in shock, the because of the dysfunctioning, there occurs decreased heart rate, decreased cardiac output, and all. So here, if epinephrine is administered through IV route, it causes increase of the systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, heart rate, and as well as cardiac output and apart from cardiogenic shock it is also recommended to give in anaphylactic shock so anaphylaxis is a condition where there occur severe allergic reactions so the shock which is caused because of the allergic life-threatening allergic reactions that shock is called as anaphylactic shock so this epinephrine or adrenaline is recommended in anaphylactic shock how does this act in anaphylactic shock so uh, the in anaphylactic shock condition, this epinephrine is given through subcutaneous route. So once it, when it is administered through subcutaneous route, if it acts on various adrenal receptors, if it is causing stimulation of alpha one receptors, it causes vasoconstriction and thereby it is causing uh, increased blood pressure. So in this way, in shock, the vasodilation takes place. That is the reason vasopressors are recommended in shock. So here when it is causing alpha 1 stimulation, it causes vasoconstriction, thereby increasing the blood pressure. And in beta 1, when the beta 1 stimulation uh, or else beta 1 receptor activation takes place, then it leads to increased heart rate, thereby increasing the cardiac output. And when cardiac output is increased, then automatically blood pressure will be increased on. And when it binds to the beta 2 receptors, the beta 2 receptor activation or stimulation causes bronchodilatation so it is releasing from the bronchial spasm and it is also used in cardiac arrest if there is any cardiac failure also epinephrine is recommended especially for bradycardia condition so bradycardia is a condition where there will be decreased heart rate so in that condition uh, epinephrine is recommended in the IV route and it is also given in di directly to the lungs. So if there is any spasm to the bronchial muscle, then also this epinephrine is directly administered to the lungs. And it is also used, it is also recommended to give in intracardial route. So if norepinephrine, if we are giving through IV route and it is not showing any effect on cardiac muscle, then it can be administered directly to the heart itself through intracardial route in order to show its actions and this nor this epinephrine is also recommended to give during surgery so how it is recommended uh, through surgery so in surgery we give anesthesia so in combination of this anesthesia or else uh, apart from anesthesia this epinephrine also is added to that anesthesia for surgery condition in order to reduce bleeding so in surgery there will be excessive bleeding so in order to reduce that bleeding this epinephrine is recommended to give and it is also uh, in order to i mean it decreases the amount of local anesthetic activity so uh, the local, what are the side effects which are caused because of this local anesthesia or the anesthesia which is given during surgery can be decreased because of the epinephrine which is given in the combination. The next category of drug is isoprenaline. So isoprenaline is also a directly acting non-selective adrenergic agonist. So this isoprenaline, it is directly acting synthetic adrenoreceptor agonist. So it is not norepinephrine and epinephrine are the neurotransmitters which is synthesized in the body but isoprenaline is not naturally synthesized in the body so it is a synthetic agonist or else it is a synthetic drug which is used as a directly acting non-selective and it binds to only beta receptors 
So here, noradrenaline and adrenaline are binding to both alpha as well as beta receptors. But here, this isoprenaline, it only binds to the beta receptors. But why it is called non-selective? Because it is binding to all the three kind of beta receptors. It is not binding to only particular beta 1 or beta 2 or beta 3 receptors. As it is binding to all the three receptors of beta, it is called as non-selective drug. And this isoprenaline has various actions. So if it is binding to the beta 1 receptors, it shows the action of increased heart rate and if there will be excessive stimulation of this beta 1 receptors, it may lead to a condition called arrhythmia as well as cardiac arrest. And one, if it is causing the stimulation of beta 2 receptors. So, these beta 2 receptors are present in the blood vessels and it causes the vasodilation of the particular smooth muscle or blood vessel. Thereby, it causes decreased blood pressure. Let us see the pharmacokinetics of this isoprenaline. So, the T half of this isoprenaline is about 5 to 7 minutes. And it is also recommended this, like all catecholamines like norepinephrine and epinephrine. This is also recommended to give only through parenteral route but not oral route. And the IV must be given carefully because overdose may cause cardiac effect. We saw... In the previous slide, we saw on beta 1 stimulation, if there is any excessive stimulation of beta 1 receptors, it leads to a condition called arrhythmia and on further, it causes cardiac arrest. So, if we are giving through IV route, IV route is such a route where we are directly giving the drug to bloodstream. So, if we are giving a drug directly to the bloodstream, it causes 100% bioavailability of the drug. In that condition, it acts very rapidly. So, if... The dose should be administered while we are giving through IV route because excessive dose may cause cardiac arrest. What are the uses of this isoprenaline? Previously, isoprenaline was used, but now it is not having, it is not much, much or uh, it's not marketed now because of the side effects. Because the isoprenaline, one thing, it is dose dependent. If there is any slightly, we can say it has narrow therapeutic index. So, what is this narrow therapeutic index? See, the dose of the drug, if it is reaching to certain level, then it shows its actions. If there is any decrease in the dose or increase in the dose, even up to 0.001 mg or microgram also, then it does not show any effect or it shows adverse effects. So, these uh, type of drugs, the type of drugs which come under this category or else, are called as narrow therapeutic index drugs and isoprenaline is one of the drugs. So, as it is dose dependent and if excessive dose occurs, it leads to side effects. Called, some few of the side effects are called bronchial spasm as it causes contraction of the bronchial muscle. So, that is the reason it is not now recommended and it is not now marketed. The other drug is dopamine. So, dopamine is also a directly acting non-selective uh, adrenoreceptor agonist as it binds to D1, D2 as well as D3 receptors. So, this dopamine, apart from dopaminergic receptors, so dopamine will bind to dopamine receptors, but apart from that, it binds to beta adrenergic receptors also. That is the reason it is called as non-selective. What happens if this dopamine binds to beta-1 receptors? So, this dopamine, once it binds to the beta-1 receptors, or else, uh, if it binds to the beta-1 receptors, it causes release of the noradrenaline. So, it is not acting directly on beta-1 receptors. It acts directly on dopamine receptors, but it acts indirectly on beta-1 receptors. So, on the stimulation of this beta-1 receptors, it causes release of noradrenaline. So, in that way, it acts. And this dopamine is also recommended to give only through parenteral route. And this dopamine, it does not cause any tolerance effect. Here we can see the metabolism of dopamine. Dopamine is also metabolized to two enzymes, MAO and COMT. And on the metabolism of the action, or else on the action of the enzyme MAO, it forms a dopac compound. And on the action of COMT, it forms 3-methyl transferase compound. So when this dopac is undergoing the, uh, or else when it is, when COMT enzyme is acting on dopac, it forms a compound called HVA, that is, um, uh, vanilla and mandelic acid and when 3-MT that is 3-methyl transferase when it is acting on the uh, when uh, three, Mao enzyme is acting on 3-methyl transferase it also forms the common compound. So this is the metabolic end product of dopamine.
So let us see the pharmacokinetics. So this dopamine is administered through parenteral route and the T half of this dopamine is about 3 to 5 minutes. And the metabolism of this dopamine mainly occurs in the uh, liver only by the uh, action of two enzymes as I told you COMT and MAO. So let us see the uses of this dopamine receptor, uh, dopamine. So what, does the, what are the main uses of dopamine? So this dopamine action varies because of the doses. So when it, dopamine is administered in small doses, for example at a dose of almost 5 microgram per kg, that is through IV infusion, then it causes stimulation. This dopamine go and binds to the dopamine receptors and it causes vasodilation of renal vascular muscles, cerebral vascular uh, vessels, a cerebral vascular system, coronary vascular system and mesenteric vascular system. So in renal, coronary, cerebral as well as mesenteric system, whatever the vascular, uh, vascular system is there or whatever the blood vessels are present in this system, it causes vasodilation when dopamine is administered in small doses. In medium doses, that is at the dose of about 5 to 15 microgram per kg of IV infusion, dopamine causes beta 1 stimulation, thereby it is re causing release of noradrenaline. And if noradrenaline is released, it there will be increase in the heart rate, cardiac output as well as blood pressure. If dopamine is administered in higher doses, that is a dose which is exceeding 15 microgram per kg then it causes stimulation of alpha 1 receptors thereby it causes vasoconstriction leading to increased blood pressure. So these are the non-selective adrenergic receptors and let us see the centrally acting adrenergic agonists. The drugs which come under this category are amphetamine. So amphetamine is a mixed acting dopaminergic drug. So it is, but it is acting in a central, I mean it is act, it is having central action. So these are the centrally acting adrenergic agonists and this is also a non-selective adrenergic receptor agonist and this acts mainly on, how does this amphetamine act? So this no amphetamine, it as I told you, it shows mixed action. So it directly acts as well as it indirectly acts. So one thing is that it causes or else it indirectly acts by enhancing the release of noradrenaline. So the noradrenaline uh, release will be increased when amphetamine is acting or else when amphetamine causes stimulation of the beta receptor, adenoreceptors as well as the dopamine release is also varied by the uh, stimulation or by the action of this amphetamine and this is a lipid soluble drug. So amphetamine is not a water soluble drug and it is a lipid soluble drug and it is gets well absorbed in the parts of intestine and CNS. Here we can see the pictorial representation. See when amphetamine is acting so the red color amphetamine when it is acting on the uh, secretory vesicles or else when it is when it exerts its actions then the noradrenaline from the uh, storage vesicles is released in the synaptic cleft and where the, the noradrenaline release it goes and binds to the alpha as well as beta adrenoreceptors and exerts its actions. What are the pharmacokinetics? So this amphetamine, we can say when compared to other non-selective drugs, it has long T half that is almost 45 to 60 minutes. So once the 45 to 50, 60 minutes is reached, then only the half drug is available or half drug is released into the systemic circulation and it is metabolized in the liver. What are the uses of this amphetamine? So one, this amphetamine is one thing, it is used in suppression of uh, appetite we can say it is also administered in obese conditions because it suppresses the appetite and in narcolepsy condition so narcolepsy is a condition or as we can say it is a sleeping disorder which causes awakeness even or which causes drowsiness even during daytime so a person feels drowsiness or sleepy even during daytime also so that condition is called as narcoleptic condition in that condition amphetamine is administered and it is also administered in att attention sorry adhd that is attention deficit hyperactivity disease so this is a kind of disease where the person will have hypersensitivity reactions and he'll 
he will be immunodeficient as well as he will uh, seek to have attention towards him. So this is called as ADHD disorder. But this amphetamine, we can say it is a drug of abuse. Because it cause, if we take amphetamine for longer duration of time, the person will get addicted for that drug. So we should be very careful while administering this amphetamine and it should be administered by the advice of medical practitioner. So what are the side effects of this uh, amphetamine? As I told you, it causes tolerance. Once it reaches a particular dose, it causes tolerance of that drug. It, it is a drug of abuse and it causes dependence. It causes addiction. It causes psychosis and sometimes it causes hypertension condition also. The other drug is ephedrine. So, ephedrine is also a mixed acting uh, non-selective drug and this non-selective drug, this ephedrine, it acts on both alpha as well as beta receptors. Here also, they indirectly stimulate the release of norepinephrine nor from, from the secretary storage vesicles into the synaptic left and exerts its actions. And this ephedrine like amphetamine it causes tolerance but it does not cause any addiction so it is recommended to give for longer duration also but once it reaches to certain dose it causes tolerance of the drug but it does not cause any addiction what are the uses of this ephedrine so this ephedrine is used as a pressure agent or as we can say it causes a vasoconstriction it is causes it is used as a vasopressor agent pressure agent in the sense which causes constriction so it causes it creates some pressure leading to the constriction so it is used as a pressure pressor agent and it it is used as a decongestant and it is uh, previously it is used in bronchial asthma but it is not used in bronchial asthma now because uh, as i told you it is used as a pressure agent so when it causes constriction over constriction of the bronchial muscle then it will worsen asthmic condition so that is the reason nowadays it is not recommended in bronchial asthma the other drug is pseudoephedrine so it Pseudoephedrine, the name itself indicates pseudoephedrine. It is like ephedrine but not exactly like ephedrine. But the pharmacological actions of the pseudoephedrine are same as ephedrine. Uh, in the sense, when it causes alpha, uh, beta uh, stimulation, then it causes constriction of the vascular smooth muscle. So the pharmacological activities or actions of this pseudoephedrine is same as that of ephedrine. And like ephedrine, it is not controlled. We can say it is an OTC drug that is over counter drug, over the counter drug. So it can be taken or else we can directly purchase the drug in the market. There is no need to for this drug to be prescribed. The other drug is phenylpropranololamine. So this is also a mixed acting non-selective drug. And this drug is also having similar pharmacological effects that of pseudoephedrine. And this the uh, it has a peculiar use apart from pseudoephedrine is that it is used as a decongestant but this uh, phenyl uh, phenylpropranolamine is not recommended to give in cerebral hemorrhage because it causes synergistic effect so what are the side effects of these all non-selective beta adrenergic agonists. So we saw the non-selective beta adrenergic agonists. So there are side effects of these drugs also. So what are the side effects? So as these are the lipid soluble drugs, they can pass through the blood brain barrier. So the, uh, the only the lipid soluble drugs can pass through blood brain barrier. So once the blood, once they cross the blood brain barrier, they cause this condition like insomnia, thus the sleeplessness, restlessness, there will be confusion in the person, irritability, anxiety, loss of appetite and hypertension. So these are the various side effects which are caused because of the non-selective adrenoreceptor agonists. These are non-selective drugs. So let us see the selective adrenoreceptor agonists. So selective in the sense they only bind to particular receptor like alpha 1 or beta 1 or alpha 2 or beta 2. So the selectivity is dependent on the type of receptor it is binding to. For example, if the drugs like phenylephrine. So phenylephrine is a selective alpha 1 agonist and clonidin. Clonidin is a drug which is a selective alpha 2 agonist 
and beta 1 selective beta 1 agonist is dobutamine salbutamol is selective beta 2 agonist and uh, retardin is also one of the drug which is a selective beta 2 agonist let us see in detail about all these drugs. So, phenylephrine. So, phenylephrine is one of the drug which is binding particularly to only alpha 1 receptor. So, the alpha 1 receptor, it goes and binds to the alpha 1 receptors and exerts its actions. And this is a directly acting drug. So, it directly goes and binds to the alpha 1 receptors and exerts its actions. Let us see the pharmacokinetics of the uh, phenylephrine. So, phenylephrine is metabolized by the enzyme called COMT. And uh, sorry, phenylephrine is not metabolized by COMT because it is not a catecholamine. So, COMT, the name itself indicates catecholamine O methyl transferase. So, only the catecholamines will be metabolized through COMT, like norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine because these are the natural catecholamines which are synthesized in the body. As phenylephrine is not an catecholamine it is not metabolized through the comt that is the reason it is having longer duration of action if a drug is not getting metabolized then it exerts its action for longer period of time let us see the therapeutic uses of this what are the uses of this phenylephrine so phenylephrine is mainly used in as a decongestant as well as it is used as a vasopressor agent in the case of hypotension, in, in hypotension condition, it is used to constrict the blood vessels or vascular muscles so, so that to relieve the person from hypotensic condition and it is also used in paroxysmal tachycardia that is when there is any increased heart rate and apart from that, it is used in midriatic condition of the eye. The other drug is clonidin. Clonidin is an alpha 2 selective agonist. So, it only binds to the alpha 2 receptors. And this clonidin, it is mainly used in the treatment of hypertension because this clonidin, when it binds to the alpha 2 receptors on stimulation, it causes vasodilation. So, that is the reason this alpha 2 clonidin is used in the treatment of hypertension. And it is acting, it, it acts centrally at presynaptic alpha 2 receptors. These are these all are centrally acting drugs. So, the alpha 2 receptors which are present in the centrally, which are present centrally at the presynaptic nase, then uh, the it goes and binds to that particular alpha 2 receptors directly and exerts its actions. The other drug is dobutamine. So, dobutamine is a directly acting drug and it is a selective beta 1 agonist. So, this dobutamine is considered even as non-selective drug also because it shows alpha as well as beta 2. But if particularly it binds to only beta 1 receptor, then it is called as selective dobutamine or selective adrenoreceptor agonist. And this dobutamine is recommended to give only through parenteral route and not through oral route. And what is the effect of this dobutamine? So dobutamine, when it binds to the beta 1 receptors, then it causes increased cardiac output. So, if cardiac output is increased, it causes increased heart rate and if heart rate is increased, it causes increased blood pressure. And apart from that, it has less arith arrhythmiogenic effects than dop dopamine. So, dopamine on side effect, the dop side effect of this dopamine is arrhythmia, attack, dis dysarrhythmia. So, this dobutamine has lesser uh, side effects when compared to dopamine. Pharmacokinetics. What are the pharmacokinetics of dobutamine? So the T half of this dobutamine is about 10 to 15 minutes. We can say it is a short acting drug and it is metabolized in the liver by oxidative deamination. So the dobutamine contains amino acids. You can, you can say we can, we can have the am amine group is present in the uh, dobutamine structure that is NH4 group. So on deamination, on removal of this amine group, because of the oxidation reaction that is called oxidative deamination, the uh, dobutamine is getting metabolized in the liver. What are the uses of this uh, dobutamine? So dobutamine is used as an inotropic agent. The agents which cause increased contractility or as they cause increased force of contraction of heart. These are the inotropic agents. In heart failure condition, uh, if there is any heart failure, these are used as an inotropic. This is used as an inotropic agent and it is used in septic as well as cardiogenic shock. 
the other drug that is selective beta 2 adrenergic agonist is salbutamol so salbutamol it directly acts on the beta 2 receptors and it is also uh, given through iv route like unlike the other drugs it is given through oral route also so it is either given through orally or iv route or even inhalation dosage forms are also present so we can see the various formulations the various formulations are uh, I mean, how the salbutamol is uh, marketed is that it is available in the form of tablets, it is available in the form of syrups, in injection form, solution form as well as inhalation forms also. What are the uses of this therapeutic, uh, what are the uses of this uh, salbutamol? So as it is a beta 2 directly or as beta 2 uh, adrenergic agonist, beta 2 is present in the bronchial smooth muscles. So when this beta 2 agonist, it causes uh, the dilation of the bronchial smooth muscle. So when this salbutamol, it binds to the beta 2 receptors, it causes activation of the beta 2 receptors and thereby it, lead, it causes bronchodilation. That is the reason it is recommended to give or else it is recommended to administer in bronchial asthma and it is also used in the treatment of refractory hyperkalemia refractory in the sense initial stage if there is any uh, if there is an increased calcium levels in the body that condition is called as hyperkalemia in the initial stages only salbutamol is used for its treatment the other drugs are salmeterol and formeterol. So salmeterol and formeterol are also the beta 2 adrenergic, selective beta 2 adrenergic agonist. Here the actions, pharmacological actions of these two drugs are similar to that of salbutamol. But the only difference is that they have longer duration of action when compared to salbutamol. Salbutamol is having 10 to 15 minutes of T half but the T half of these two drugs differ rapidly and these two drugs are also recommended as uh, in bronchial asthma in the form of inhalations. The other beta 2 receptor uh, selective agonist is uh, retodrin. So retodrin is also one of the beta 2 selective uh, adrenergic drug and this is used to uh, treat I mean this is used to delay premature labor. So it is used in the premature labor, it is used to delay the premature labor because this beta 2 muscles or this beta 2 receptors are also present in the uterine muscles. So when this uh, retodrin is administered, it causes stimulation of beta 2 receptors in the uterine system and there it causes a relaxation of the uterine muscles, thereby it delays the premature labor. What are the clinical applications of this selective adrenergic receptors? So these selective adrenergic receptors, they have various clinical effects like they are used in the hypotension, especially phenylephrine drug. Phenylephrine drug is used to treat hypotension and in shock, there are various shocks like hypovolemic shock, cardiac shock and septic shock. So the drugs like salbutamol, the drugs like uh, dopamine, dobutamine, these are used to treat shock. What are the symptoms which are involved in the shock? So in shock we can see the congestion in the heart, lungs as well as kidneys and it causes bronchoconstriction and hypotension. So in all these conditions these uh, adrenergic, selective adrenergic agonists are recommended and the epinephrine it is administered. Epinephrine is a steroid uh, or else we can say epinephrine is a adrenergic agonist which is administered with steroids and other antihistamine drugs. So why it is administered in addition to these drugs because it causes bronchodilation and it increases the blood pressure and thereby it is used as a, as a decongestant also. So in neurogenic shock in cardiac cardio uh, genic shock also this uh, these uh, uh, adrenergic agonists are recommended for example the drugs like dobutamine and dopamine so these are mainly used in the treatment of cardiogenic as well as neurogenic shock and these drugs are even administered to reduce the blood flow in certain organs so if there is any rapid blood flow in order to reduce or regulate the or stimulate the blood flow in these particular organs these adrenergic receptors are recommended to give and apart from these, apart from these clinical uses, the adrenergic receptor, ad, receptor agonists also have the clinical applications in bronchial asthma, cardiac arrest, mitriasis, 
paroxysmal tachycardia in delaying uh, labor, premature labor in hypokinetic children syndrome and in narcolepsy condition. Let us see the side effects. So each and every drug has its own side effects. So that these adrenoreceptor, selective adrenoreceptor agonists have the side effects like if they are acting on this cardiovascular system, they on excessive dose, they cause hypotension, they cause cardiac arrhythmia, they cause myocardial infarction. So myocardial infarction is a condition where the cardiac tissue is replaced by the fibrous tissue leading to the cardiac failure. And it causes increased severity of angina pectoria. If a person is suffering from angina, if we give this adrenoreceptor, selective adrenoreceptor agonist, they synergize or they have give additive effect of angina pectoris and even in myocardial infarction also. And in eye, so what are the effects of these on eye? So if they are given in excessive doses, it causes increased intraocular pressure. If intraocular pressure is increased, it leads to a condition called glaucoma. So glaucoma is a condition or eye disorder where it causes blindness. So if intraocular pressure is released, it leads to the blindness of the person or the person will lose his vision. And on CNS, so in on CNS, if they... Uh, what are the side effects on CNS? So on CNS, it causes damage to the various organs and if they pass through the blood-brain barrier, then it causes insomnia, restlessness and various other side effects if it is acting on the central nervous system.